Uh, my name is Dr. Kurt Perkins. What I do is functional chiropractic and lifestyle medicine. Kind of what my passion is, is helping people create a thing I like to call more health and less health care. But kind of what makes my heart sing at the end of the day is helping good people out of bad situations. And this thyroid epidemic that we're having is one of those bad situations. But I don't really know if it's such a thyroid problem. Because um, if you look at it, you probably all know someone that has a thyroid condition or has been on some sort of thyroid medication, or they've been told their thyroid's malfunctioning, all that scenario. When everyone has something, that's kind of like a red flag in the back of my head of, that's probably not the true cause of something, but an effect of a bunch of other things. And so, we're gonna talk about today, is it really my thyroid? And we'll talk a little about a thyroid, but we're also gonna talk about the other things that could be causing a thyroid to malfunction. Now the thyroid's, what we like to call the canary in the coal mine. It's a very sensitive organ to everything that happens in the body. Um, specifically because the hormones from the thyroid talk to the DNA directly. And so when you're talking to the DNA directly, that could affect something else in the body. That could affect toenail growth. It could affect memory. It could affect heart function. It could affect metabolism. And so the thyroid has a lot of play into everything else that's going to happen to you from a health standpoint. Now we have our disclaimer. This is for informational and educational purposes. Hopefully it's a little entertaining as well. Um, but if you have specific questions, I'll give you an opportunity to do that at the end or you can set up a phone call with me and all this or the canned answer is consult with your doctor or other healthcare professional. But I put a caveat to that because most of your doctors and healthcare professionals aren't going to have a clue what I'm talking about today. And so I'm going to give a lot different perspective. Um, and so you can talk to me instead. I'm one of those healthcare professionals and doctors. So fun facts about the thyroid. What do you think the thyroid does? What kind of functions? It's a regulate system. Metabolism. Metabolism is a huge one. Hormone Part of your hormones. Energy. Energy. Mood. Mood. Growth. Growth. Body temperature. Temperature. Sleep. Sleep. You're not going to have a wrong answer, remember, because it talks to the DNA, so it can affect almost virtually in every function in the body. And so most, most oftentimes people kind of suspect they have a thyroid problem if they're having problems with metabolism. So I'm gaining weight, um, I can't shed the weight as quick as I normally do, or those types of things. Weight regulation, heat production, so it's your internal thermostat. Glucose oxidation, so basically how you utilize blood sugars. Your kidneys, so how you clear the water through it. Heart rate and contractions. Maintains blood pressure. Your calcium storage, so we say think bone density and all those other things that we, we are throwing calcium at, which is not the solution either. And that's kind of a side note too. Don't just assume the mechanism that Big Pharma uses is correct. So we see bone needs calcium, so we're gonna chuck calcium at it. What's happened ever since we've chucked calcium at bone density problems? More. We've had more bone density problems, right? <laughs> or take antidepressants. Their theory is it's an imbalance or deficiency in serotonin. And so let's throw drugs at it, and even let's throw natural stuff. People might use L-theanine and some other supplements to increase production of serotonin, thinking that that mechanism is correct. But ever since we've early detected, early treated depression, what's happened to depression rates? Right, it's increased. And we actually have more disability due to depression since we've early detected and early treated it. And this could be for back pain, this could be for heart disease, this could be for cancer, this could be for whatever. Whenever we start throwing 
mechanisms to treat the symptom of the problem, we increase our disability rates due to that problem. So you got to step back and think, okay, this isn't working, let's look at a different avenue. Uh, maturation and reproduction, huge infertility problems going on with couples today. Tissue growth and repair. Developing fetus and childhood growth. This is huge, especially for the rise of ADHDs and autisms and Asperger's and sensory processing. A lot of those can actually stem in womb from mom who is thyroid deficient but was never looked at that way because they just based her thyroid on one little TSH score when there's about 10 other factors that need to be analyzed to give a true picture of the thyroid health. Developing skeletal and nervous systems. I used to have a professor say skeletal, and we're like, what the heck is this guy saying? But he was Canadian. Uh, GI motility. So what we have with all those things is we have 59 million Americans suffering from thyroid conditions. One million will die this year of heart disease. So 59 million astronomically towers with, with heart disease rates. Hypo is the most common, so an underperforming thyroid. And 90% of thyroid conditions are Hashimoto's. Do you guys know what Hashimoto's is? It's an autoimmune reaction. So your thyroid's being attacked by your immune system, which causes that to malfunction. I can't tell you how many people that have come to me with thyroid problems and they're like, I can't figure it out. They've been on Synthroid for 20 years, but nobody ever ran a test to see if there's an autoimmune condition going on. And then we run that test and their, their antibodies just skyrocket off. Like, you've had an autoimmune condition for all these years. And the problem with that is when one, auto, one autoimmune condition starts, it often sets the stage for other autoimmune conditions. So when there's one, there's oftentimes multiple others. And at least in my practice, thyroid meds are usually the top three, three that I see most often. So antidepressants, thyroid meds, and cholesterol meds are usually what I see those top three. But it always comes back to why. <laughs> why is there so many of these thyroid problems? Are we de-evolving? Is this the whole survival or survival of the fittest from Darwin that we're all just a bunch of are we going to be the extinct population pretty soon, is, is basically what I'm asking. No, I don't think so either. So you got to look at other aspects of it. Why would you guys think there's a big thyroid epidemic in our country? Yep. Yep, so you guys say the So poor nutrition, iodine is one of those components of the nutrition. Anything else? What's that? Too many drugs, yeah, that can interfere with how your thyroid performs. Stress. Stress is a huge one. I was going to say dehydration because people are drinking everything but water. Yeah, dehydration, so another nutritional deficiency. I think our food these days, there's something, we've added things to the food. Well, the food and that's, and that's what our body is. Right, so we're eating more Franken food opposed to. Mm -hmm whatever. For me, it starts to come back to the nervous system. And why is the nervous system so important with thyroid or with any, any aspect of your body? Is that how things travel? Signals travel? Yeah, it's how signals travel. But your nervous system is what's going to organize and coordinate life. So if someone just busted through that door, with a machete flipping back and forth, your nervous system is going to react one way and you're going to react one way. You're going to go into flight or flight mode. Or if someone busted through that door and said, you guys all won the Powerball together, we're going to have a different reaction to that. So we're going to organize and coordinate those two different experiences in a manner that's going to keep us surviving another day. And how it's going to organize is you're going to be organized either into protection, so there's the machete bear attack, or it's going to be um, organized into growth, growth mode, which is Powerball or roses or hover, something happy in your event. For most people, where do you think they reside? Protection mode or growth mode? Protection. So what's going to happen during that protection mode? 
let's say they unleash tigers and lions through that, that door, your brain and spinal cord are on alert, what's the first organ it's going to hit? Adrenal. Adrenal, exactly. And why would that be important? Because what, what do the adrenals do? What hormones do they release? Adrenaline. Adrenaline, yeah. And what's that going to do to your heart rate? Go up. What's going to happen to your blood pressure? It's going to go up. What's going to happen to your respiratory rate, your breathing? Yeah, shallow, faster. What's going to happen to cholesterol? Goes up. Goes up. But why? Yeah, cholesterol is basically the super glue that holds you together. So there's a potential of injury with lions and tigers being released into the room. So just in case, the liver says, let me spurt out some cholesterol to make sure there's enough patchwork after the event is done, after they tranquilize them and get them out of the room. What about blood clotting factors? Up or down? Up. So we have increase in blood pressure, increase in heart rate, increase in cholesterol, increased respiratory rate, and increase in clot factors. What does that sound like if you went to the emergency room? Heart yeah, in the middle of a heart attack. But did those factors just save your life or do they just save your life? So increase in blood pressure and heart rate, all those things aren't bad, they're appropriate. Short term, very appropriate, it's when they happen long term that now that becomes life-threatening. So your body never does stupid stuff. It's going to organize and coordinate in a response that's going to keep you living till the next day. The problem is we're always going to err on the side of caution. We're going to favor protection, and we can't be in protection and growth at the same time. What else is going to happen? So we have our cardiac output skyrocketing. What do you think? The, the, or sorry, let me backtrack. Adrenals release another hormone called cortisol. What does that one do? <laughs> That's what most people say. They call it the stress hormone or the weight gain hormone or something of that nature. Again, if it didn't happen, you wouldn't survive those lions and bears and tigers because it dumps sugar into your blood. So if you're not actively eating a Frappuccino and Snickers bar and all those things, you got to get it from somewhere else. So your body's going to literally break itself down to get to that sugar to dump it into your bloodstream so you can escape this potential danger. So blood sugar high, short term, great. Long term, what happens? Yeah, not so great. So we talk about diabetes. There's another hormone involved with that. What would it be? Insulin. Insulin. See, you guys are a smart group. Is insulin going to be on the protection side or is it going to be on the growth side? Yeah, more growth. So if we're on the protection side, we have cortisol saying, I'm going to dump sugar into the bloodstream. On the growth side, saying, hey, that's dangerous. I'm going to release insulin to store sugar for potentially later. Which one do you think your nervous system is going to listen to more? Yeah, protection. It'll listen to cortisol, so it'll favor the sugar. Therefore, your cells will stop listening to insulin. You become insulin resistant. So we have high blood sugar, insulin resistance. There's your setup for diabetes, setup for obesity. But more importantly, and I'll get to it later, insulin has far larger roles in hormone conversion and nutrient absorption and all those other things that are going to help you keep living opposed to just surviving. So we have cardiac, we have um, blood sugar problems. What's going to happen to your immune system? Are you worried about catching a cold if lions and bears and tigers come flying through the door? No. So your immune system starts to depress. We're coming up on flu season. Is it really a magic bug, or are we in a season of decreased immunity? Right. 
because we go from Halloween to Thanksgiving to Christmas to New Year's to Valentine's Day to St. Patty's Day to Easter to Mardi Gras. What do all those have in common? Right, a high sugar content. And sugar biochemically looks very similar to vitamin C. So they're going to compete for each other to get into your cells. So instead of just taking uber amounts of vitamin C, worry about catching that sugar load instead. The candy's the obvious one, but the wheat products, that raises your blood sugar more than a Snickers bar and M&Ms combined. So that's gonna be the other sugar load that we're not so, we don't look at as a bowl of sugar, um, but in, your body responds the same way. So immune system goes down, so that makes us more susceptible to, say, the flu. But what about cancer? Cancer is an immune system problem. Autoimmunity is an immune system problem. And so you can kind of see the, the level of, of stuff going on here. Remember, you, if you take away one thing today, you can't be in growth and protection at the same time. Your body's always going to choose, and it's always going to err on the side of caution just in case. Question? So just to backtrack a little bit, so what are you saying is pushing us into the protection mode? We'll get to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, we're going to define stress. So stress is going to push us that way, but I'm going to broaden your scope of what stress is. So in this growth mode, that's where your immune system is going to be mostly. That's where thyroid is going to be. That's where immunity is going to be. That's where fertility is going to be. That's where digestion is going to be. So think if we're always running from bears, so to speak, Look at the problems we have health-wise chronically, digestive problems, fertility problems, immune problems, um, cardiac problems, because that's, that's firing. And you can start to see the imbalance of for our chronic illness state in our country that it's all going to reside. And so it all comes down to, oh, sorry. It all comes down to stress but I'm going to subcategorize stress into two categories. So one is deficiency, one is toxicity. And this is where my background started. I was actually going to be a pharmacist. That was going to be my original plan of action for the rest of my life. Um, I grew up, a lot of us were talking before we started, I grew up in upstate New York. And my dad was a pastor on a very small church with an average age of probably 63. Um, I was the youth group. So I was very, like once my brother and sister went off to college, that was it, I was, that was me. So I basically had about 20 sets of grandparents, um, so I couldn't get away with anything, but we had a, it was a very close-knit community and we had potlucks a lot after, after church dinners, usually about once a month. What I remember is these little Dixie cups and little colorful looking things inside those Dixie cups in front of probably 80% of people's play settings and getting mad at why do they get candy and I don't get candy at every, at every meal. Right. And so someone sent me aside, they're like, no, those are pills to make them better. And so I kind of had this paradigm one of pills make you better. Now I was also the sick kid. I was chronic bronchitis, um, obese kid, chronic strep throat, chronic um, ear infections, and eczema so bad if I opened my hands up, they would just crack and bleed. And so the mode of action to help me get better was I would take this pill or this potion or this cream, usually given to me by mom, who was an RN. And so I had that paradigm like hammered into my head, pills make you better. Without everyone ever to say it, more, more is caught than taught. So if you have kids or grandkids, you want them to do something, you better be doing it yourself because they're gonna catch that more than what your words are saying. So as I aged throughout high school into that church, I noticed those Dixie cups were getting fuller and fuller, and there was more prayer requests for different procedures and health complaints and all this. So I'm like, all right, I got to go fast. I got to get to college and get on this right track because maybe they're not getting the right pills. So if pills are what make you better, my paradigm was then, by deductive logic, was they're not getting the right ones because they're not getting better. Got a semester into it, my advisor, who was instrumental in my career today, but more from the negative aspect of it, said, I've seen kids like you before. I'm not going to let you continue down this program. Like, your grades aren't good enough. Um, she didn't really give me any concrete reason why. 
just I'm not going to let you keep going on this program. So that Christmas break opened up our course manual and I saw biochemistry, which was in her field, so to speak, but not in her department. So I had a new advisor. So my thing was at the end of four years, I could have this science degree, which was probably harder than originally, rub it in her face. And then that was my, my sole reason for graduating college at the time, was, <laughs> was out of spite more than any career plans down the road. Joke was on me, she retired a year later, so I never got that satisfaction of it. But then I was ingrained into the science program, which at the point I'm like, yeah, it's cool, but I have no idea what I'm gonna do with it. My new advisor had grants from the NIH. Um, so he was a biochemist and we were sequencing DNA of bacteria. And this bacteria was actually chlamydia. So in college, when someone's like, hey, what are you studying? And you're just like, hey, I work with chlamydia. like not the best way to get a date. And so, needless to say, I had the most time on my hand to dedicate to my studies during my college years. My second semester senior year, so you're ending going towards graduation, you're like, I have no idea what my plans are after college. And this guy's grooming me back into the pharmaceutical tech research aspect where, hey, if we can sequence this DNA, we can create something that inhibits the proliferation of this bacteria. Well, my head was like, well, I know how chlamydia can be prevented. It's a lifestyle disease. It's not just something people get from the unlucky club. So I had two conflicting messages. One was, here's the Petri dish. It has to be perfect, the right temperature, the right nutrients, the right oxygen levels. And here's the bacteria with the DNA that's going to dictate whether that's going to be healthy or sick. And so it's either this DNA that's going to make it healthy or sick, or it's this environment that's going to make it healthy or sick. So I started being that kid and played around a little bit, where I would use a dirty dish and the cells wouldn't grow very well or they would die off. Or I would use a different temperature, I would leave it out instead of putting it in the incubator and the cells wouldn't grow. Or we'd put not enough nutrients in it and the cells wouldn't grow. And so every time I played with the environment, the environment always won. So the DNA was just the constant in the equation where the environment was the variable and that's us on a larger scale. We're that one cell in a petri dish times 70 trillion in an environment of who knows what's out there. We can't see, taste, or smell everything. So I figured if this would translate into one cell, it could translate into the human cells. And that's kind of what led me more to chiropractic. It wasn't so much for back pain, neck pain, that type of stuff. It was more that gave me the best avenue to work with people's personal environments, how they eat, how they move, how they think, in order to change their health outcomes. And so that story comes back to here because that's what people are dealing with is the stress, the deficiency, their toxicity. So the cell, we're either not getting what we require, so we're deficient, and you guys mentioned hydration, iodine, or you mentioned toxicity, so the industrial chemicals or the Franken foods or those things. But again, I wanna expand it, so not just mental, emotional, fear, worry, versus happy, joy, or food, but think of physical deficiency and, and toxicity. So when we sit all day in a cubicle, that's gonna be deficient of movement, which is a required nutrient for the brain, and it's also a toxicity in certain signals that basically are like injuries to the brain. And now if you look at Google, type in sitting disease, and you'll see it's being equated to smoking. So it, it, it broadens the, array, the uh, horizons into the scope I call lifestyle medicine. But you guys are smart, so you guys can figure out what are you deficient in, what are you toxic in, just like you would a plant. So if you have a wilting plant, what would you give it to make it better? Water. What if you gave it water and it was still wilting? Oh, maybe it needs something else. You need sunlight. So now you put it in the sunshine, you give it the appropriate amount of water, clean water, and it's still wilting. Nutrients. Now you need some nutrients. Those are great things, but it's still wilting. What's your next conclusion? Environment. What about it? <laughs> it needs a different place to grow. There's no place for it to grow. It's in a confined spot. Okay. That's my take on it. I may be wrong, but that's 
No, that's good. So that's something else it requires. It needs more space. Yes. Pests. Could be rewrapped. Yeah. So you guys are smarter than me when it comes to horticulture here. <laughs> I was making it more simple. So, so you've given it everything it requires, but then you just have to start asking questions of what doesn't it require. And maybe your neighbor at night is spraying diesel fuel into the soil when you're, when you're sleeping. So you gotta address deficiency and address toxicity. And this is where it has to happen to you guys. This is why I say more health, less healthcare, because what they do in healthcare is they try to quantify these things. And they do it by doing studies. And it always seems good that there's a study for something, but it's how that study gets interpreted. So let's say these researchers are like, we're gonna end wilt plant wilting worldwide, but we gotta study what it, what it needs. So we're gonna take 100 plants, 50 of them give them real water, 50 of them give them fake water. And at the end of our study, they're all wilting. Now you guys already said they need to add something, but what would they conclude? They would conclude that water is no good for wilting plants. And that anyone that gives water to wilting plants isn't practicing evidence-based science. And then you'll see these headlines in the news water, dangerous for plants, and it'll get escalated and escalated and escalated. You guys are already smarter, so you said it needs sunlight. So you lobby to the researchers and be like, you need to study this other intervention in conjunction with it because it's not just a singular requirement that it needs. So now you need four groups. So we have our 100 plants, a quarter of them get real water and real sunlight, a quarter get real water, fake sunlight, a quarter get fake water, real sunlight, I think I said that right, and the quarter gets fake and fake. It's still wilting at the end of that study. What's their conclusion now? Sun water are What's that? Sun and water are yeah, now sun and water are no good for wilting plants. Would you say they got better or not based on you gave them water, you gave them sunlight that they require, did that make them better or not? Depends how you define better, right? So this is where like the interpretation of research starts coming in, in, into play. I would say they got better because you gave them something they required. They would say they didn't get better because they're still wilting. What if I gave them water, sunlight, they're still wilting, but then I painted the leaves green and like stacked them up so they're nice and, and, and stable? Would that be better because it looks better? No, so you can't base it on the symptom alone. But that's what a lot of research does is here's the, the symptom of it. Did the symptom get better? Did the symptom get worse? And we're going to base our outcomes on that. They do this with cholesterol drugs. Does cholesterol come down? Yes, therefore it's successful. What they didn't ask was, did lowering cholesterol save lives? And they can't ever answer that without saying no. Um, because the more we've lowered cholesterol, the more heart disease has gone up and deaths from heart disease. So you're like, you guys are idiots. You gotta add nutrients into it. So now we have nine groups from real, 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 all the way down to fake, fake, fake. And the plant is still wilting. You guys gave exactly what it requires. In my book, it's better. In their book, not better. And that's where you have to start looking at the, the toxicity aspect of it. And so with thyroid coming back through thyroid, this is the part that's kind of the hard part because there's a lot of things that you can't see, taste, smell, hear, any of those things that are gonna be detrimental to the thyroid. And so one of those chemicals is called phenols. And you're gonna see these a lot in your detergents, your pesticides, your plastics. Um, and what it does is it damages the liver. Why would the liver be important to the thyroid? Good, you're gonna learn something then. Okay, you guys are smarter than I am. <laughs> it converts. So you have, if you guys are familiar with lab work, you usually get a, a test called TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone. That's actually a pituitary hormone, not even a thyroid hormone. So the pituitary talks to thyroid with TSH the thyroid primarily gives out an inactive hormone called T4. T4 has to go through the liver 
to be converted to T3, and now T3 is the active form of thyroid, which then can go to the DNA and do its business there, or it can cycle back up to the brain and say, hey, we need more or less, and kind of regulate that way. So these phenols, one, can damage the liver, but then two, lower T4 conversion. So look for those, and a lot of products, especially here, they'll boast no phenols. Or if you look at the ingredients, usually that phenol is at the end of something like polyphenol or XYZ. Flame retardants. These are things you probably can't get away from because there's so many regulations around it. So mattresses, buildings, airplanes, and clothes. So if you travel a lot, this might be a big, big component to people. If you're in and out of hotels, you're in different airports, you're in different airplanes, um, and if also if you're, if especially with, if you're buying clothes for newborn babies, you're going to see this a lot. We had some friends in a study, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the Environmental Working Group, but they did a study with, I think it was, I think it was flame retardants. Um, so they tested mom's level and baby's level, and baby's levels were drastically higher because of all the newer clothing and the carpet, they're more on those surfaces and all those types of things. So it's just kind of one of those eye-opening that our kids are being exposed to this way more than, than we are at an earlier age, which kind of is accumulating effects. Parabens, you'll see this a lot with sunscreens. Um, cosmetics, so a few ladies, maybe gentlemen if you wear cosmetics, I don't know food preservatives, but this actually destroys the thyroid tissue. So this is a kind of a direct attack against it. Phthalates, so more plastics, more cosmetics. So another knock against makeup for you ladies. Go natural. Pesticides and herbicides. This is why I love natural grocers, because all their produce is organic. You don't have to look at the numbers. Is there a nine in front of it, or is it just the regular number? It's easy, you just pick it off the shelf. So decreases T4 production and goiter forming. And halides, this is where you're gonna find in your tap water. So avoid tap water like the plague. So your chlorine, fluoride, bromide, because these all compete with iodine. So the more these other halides are in there, so we talk about iodine deficiency. One, it could be, yes, we don't have enough iodine in the food, but also we're consuming a lot of other things that are, can compete with that iodine. And again, it's not just for us adults. We're seeing this in the third generation, not even born yet. So that same group, the Environmental Working Group, did a, did a study. It was very expensive, so only had 10 subjects, but they took 10 babies out of New York City, New York City Hospital, totally random. They did basically a, a screen for these industrial chemicals so the baby just born, first breath of air, they, they tested the cord blood, and they were already exposed to 287 industrial chemicals. So coming from mom, potentially coming from grandma. Because let's say grandma's a smoker, she's developing mom, well mom's developing the germs for that next, next generation. So a lot of things that we call genetic are not so much genetic, it's, it can be what we call epigenetic. So the, the play between environment and our DNA. So let's talk about thyroid. Let's say grandma is thyroid deficient, but nothing overtly, wouldn't have gotten tested for it, wouldn't have been diagnosed. Baby can only produce thyroid levels up to the amount that mom can give her. And then when, so baby's born essentially thyroid deficient, and then that third generation is even more deficient than that that second and first. So when I assess, is it really my thyroid, I'm actually assessing five different things. So yes, we assess the thyroid, but it's in context. And so the first part is that autonomic imbalance. So that's the protection mode versus the growth mode. If someone is in the protection mode, thyroid's a growth hormone. So guess what's gonna compete with thyroid? your nervous system. And so we have to have balance that out. And that could be mental and emotional problems that maybe I'm not equipped to handle. 
It could be lifestyle problems, which I'm very equipped to handle through nutrition, fitness, XYZ, supplementation, food, all those types of things. But that's where it's got to start. If someone's, like I had a lady with, with hypothyroid, her company was literally killing her and she was the owner of the company. <laughs> so we, we developed strategies to either you hire someone to take over this role or you sell your company and, and get away from it. And so she hired on somebody and huge, huge difference because it took that stress off of her that was shifting her into protection mode even though her diet was great, even though her, her fitness regime was great, even though everything else lifestyle was pretty on par. It was that component that didn't, she didn't realize how much it was actually affecting her outcomes. You have to assess the adrenal function. So remember, adrenal spit out cortisol. That dumps sugar into the blood. Insulin has a response, which will get to it. But cortisol actually directly competes with T4. So remember, T4 is released by the thyroid. It could also compete with TSH. So you may have dysfunctional TSH and T4 scores because you have cortisol out of control. So if you're getting tested for thyroid, you have to get tested for adrenals in the same, same manner because they play a picture with each other. Insulin resistance. So we talked about, again, sugar being dumped, insulin gets released. If you're in protection mode, you're not gonna listen to insulin and so therefore your insulin resistance. The first place to become insulin resistant is the liver. So remember, what do those hormones, thyroid hormones have to convert through? They have to convert through the liver. So if the liver is not accepting insulin and hormones, then you may have more of a conversion problem than an actual thyroid problem. So just to keep throwing TSH at the problem, or even uber amounts of iodine, may not be the actual reason why, why the thyroid's malfunctioning. Inflammation. For one, inflammation will directly attack the thyroid. One of the biggest sources of inflammation is actually our midsection. It'll release these hormones, so our fat tissue releases a hormone, or a, a signal called a cytokine, that triggers the liver to produce CRP. And if you guys have ever had a cardiac test, usually they test CRP. But CRP is an inflammatory marker, and that basically recruits other inflammatory markers. And so most people think, hey, I'm gaining weight because my thyroid's deficient, when it actually could be the other way around. You could have some insulin resistance packing on some excess weight, and now the inflammatory signals from the excess weight is now damaging the thyroid, so there's another cycle. So a lot of people got stuck with their weight loss or thyroid problems because they haven't addressed the inflammation component of it. And then the final component you have to address is the, is the immune system side. So we said thyroid is 90% autoimmune. This is where this comes into play. So for simplicity, and the immune system is not simple by any means, um, they keep discovering more and more stuff, but Essentially, there's two branches to it. One side is the inflammation branch, and the other side is the antibody side. So when you have a coffee, runny nose, fever, diarrhea, upset stomach, that's going to be that inflammatory side. That's for you to get rid of the bug, get rid of the virus. You sneeze at 35 miles an hour and expel that thing 30 feet to get it out of you. Or if you're hanging out in porcelain Johnny, it's going out the other end, that's a good thing to get rid of that stuff. When we're in bear attack, that side starts to come down. Because let's say we're running around from the bears, you jump over a chair to get away, and you crank your ankle. You're like, this is it. I'm, I'm the meal for these bears. You get up, you look down, and you're like, hey, it's not that bad. I can put some weight on it, and I can keep running around in circles until, until someone tranquilizes them. Once the event is done, the animals are gone, now you look down and you have this muffin top ankle hanging over your shoe because now all the inflammation is back. So inflammation will be shut down short term to make sure you can survive the next day. The problem is when that happens long term, now the antibody side has to overwork to kind of trigger the other side. 
So when we have this imbalance in immune function, antibodies start to work more and more and more. Now we talked about protection and growth. That inflammatory side, one of the big areas that you're going to find that is a lot of the lining of the gut. So remember, digestion is going to be on that protection side. So if we're in growth mode, digestion starts to be compromised. That lining of the gut now doesn't keep things in as it should, starts opening up some gaps in the gut, and now even what you're eating can escape into your bloodstream. It doesn't matter if it's a bacteria, virus, or broccoli. Your body says, hey, that shouldn't be there. I'm going to go attack it just to err on the side of caution. And now we have this immune reaction going again and again and again, which could be to certain foods you're reacting. Those antibodies get built up, and then they're going to start to search and destroy anything that looks very similar to it. So this is why gluten can be a problem for people with thyroid problems, because they'll have a very similar chemical structure. Um, and so there's a bunch of... That's just kind of scratching the surface of, of that aspect of it. But just treating a thyroid with a TSH didn't come close to addressing why it's malfunctioning or even addressing the aspect of making you better in the long term.